This is The Thriving Dentist Show with Gary Takas, where we help you develop your ideal dental practice, one that provides personal, professional, and financial satisfaction. Welcome to another episode of The Thriving Dentist Show. I'm Gary Takas, your podcast co-host. Um, we have what I think is a very interesting episode for you today. It's titled, Are Your Team Members Disengaged? Well, I think you're going to like this one. Uh, lots of cool information that I think you can apply. Uh, before we get to that episode, uh, two quick announcements to make. Uh, the first announcement is coming up about a month after we publish this episode is our next Thriving Dentist Masterclass. This is a brand new masterclass. I've been working on it uh, and uh, really developing the slides, developing the presentation, and I can't wait to share it with you. The title for that masterclass is Keys to Creating a Practice that Provides Work-Life Balance. Now, this is a topic I'm passionate about. I believe the work-life balance issue uh, is, a, is a problem in dentistry. And if you talk to most dentists, uh, they'll tell you that their work-life balance isn't where they'd like it to be. It isn't where they want it to be. They're, they're okay on the work part, not so much on the life part. And so I'm passionate about helping dentists achieve an effective work-life balance. So we decided to put together this masterclass with lots of tips uh, to help you move uh, towards a practice that does a better job of providing uh, an effective work-life balance. You know, if you succeed in every other way, that we measure success in your practice, but it comes at the expense of work-life balance, then I'm going to argue that that's not a success. If your success comes at the expense of your relationship with your spouse or partner, if it comes at the expense of your relationship with your kids, if it comes at the expense of your health, maybe you say, hey, I'd like to get serious about my health, but I don't have time. Uh, if it comes at the expense of you following your other interests and hobbies, and I'm going to argue that it's not success at all. And I'm a big believer that you can have it all. Now, it's not easy. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Well, that masterclass is Tuesday, uh, September 26th. Uh, it's a three-hour masterclass, 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern time. You'll get three hours of CE credits, very inexpensive, uh, less than $90 tuition. We try to make those as affordable as possible. It's done in a live stream format, meaning that you attend from the comfort and convenience of your home or office. Uh, and uh, no no travel expense, but it's done live. So you can ask me questions and we can be engaged. And that's why we limit attendance to our master classes. Even though they're done virtually, we do limit the attendance. Uh, historically, our, our master classes sell out. If you'd like to register for that master class, go to thrivingdentist.com forward slash master class. Hey, I'll look forward to seeing you there again, Tuesday evening, September 26th. The next announcement I have is we have a returning guest. You're going to recognize his voice uh, immediately. It's Dr. Mo Budak. Uh, Dr. Budak is uh, an instructor at UCLA, um, but he also is uh, interested in one of my favorite topics, which is history. And what you're about to hear is part four on the series, The History of Dentistry. And during this segment, uh, Dr. Budak is going to cover from the Middle Ages to the modern era. With no further ado, here's Dr. Mo Budak, part four, history of dentistry from the Middle Ages to the modern era. Hello, folks. Mo Budak here, presenting the history of dentistry in five minutes, episode four. We go from the Middle Ages to the modern era. When we last left off, we were talking about Apollonia, the patroness saint of dentistry. She was martyred in Alexandria, Egypt in 240 ACE when she refused to give up her Christianity. Her teeth were all pulled. She was pointed to the stake of fire and she self-immolated herself to become martyred. Many images and beautiful paintings were done of her. This one by Andy Warhol. Okay, the beginnings of the profession in the Middle Ages. The medieval era extends from the fall of the Roman Empire from 476 A.C.E. for about a thousand years. Tracing back to ancient China in 700 A.C.E., the medical text in China from the time mentions the use of silver mixed with mercury and other metals to create a silver paste, the first known amalgam dental filling material. In the ancient Jewish civilization, starting back in 730 BCE, this was during the time of the prophets, where medicine and dentistry gained a foothold. 
This was considered mostly a preachly, a priestly approach regarding health and disease as emanating from the divine source and also utilizing the worm theory. However, man was given intellect and, 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 and creation from God to cure his own ails. A Jewish dentist by the name of Asef ben Barachia is mentioned in the Talmud, which was written in the second century A.C.E. In the Middle Ages, Jews were often the only dentists available in many parts of Europe. This was because they were often excluded from other professions. As a result, they developed a reputation for being skilled dentists. By 1150 A.C.E., Moses Maimonides, Rambam, otherwise known as Maimon, wrote a treatise on dentistry that was considered to be one of the most important works on the subject at the time. He arose as a famous Jewish philosopher, jurist, and physician who led the charge in all things in medicine and dentistry of the times. He was the foremost intellectual figure of the high medieval era, and he also utilized the ideas of Hammurabi and Aristotle as we reviewed in previous episodes. During the Arab civilization, we know that during the dark ages of early Europe Middle Ages, knowledge and science declined massively. However, during that same period of time, Arab civilization flourished in their development of medical skills. And we begin by talking about a man by the name of al Busasis. He was his date of birth and death were 936 to 1013 ACE. He was an Arab dentist born near Cordoba, Spain. He described extractions, reduction of fractures, and the treatment of dislocated in his jaws in his book, The Atlas Riff. He was considered to be the greatest surgeon of the Middle Ages and father of modern surgery. Moving into ancient Persia, we have Ahawani. This was during the Islamic Golden Age. The Persians set down treatment and cures for dental maladies. Ahawani disputed the dental worm theory in his writings of the Hidiyat. In Europe, during the Dark Middle Ages, medieval monks assumed practicing dentistry in the years 500 to 1000 A.C.E. During the Dark Ages, as I've already reported, very little scientific process progress occurred. European monks practiced medicine and surgery because they were the most educated people of that period. They used honey, bitter plants, myrrh, aloe, colocynth, acids, and the urine of young boys. In 1130 to 1163 ACE, papal edicts prohibited monks from performing surgery. And because barbers visited monasteries to shave the monks' heads, they observed and learned from the monks doing surgery. Because barbers had the surgically useful tools of the trade, razors and sharp knives, it was natural for them to take over. The lay barbers therefore became barber surgeons, and they were responsible for bloodletting, lancing, abscesses, extracting teeth, and more. In this painting, the Dutch painter Andreas Both depicts a barber surgeon extracting the man, extracting a tooth on a suffering man while his wife and daughter look on, and I admire the look on the barber surgeon's face, that of confidence and empathy. By 1210, the Guild of Barbers in Paris occurred. The first trade associations were known as guilds. The barber surgeons were split between those with greater knowledge and skill, so-called surgeons of the long robe, and those with lesser skill, so-called surgeons of the short robe. By 1300, the split was complete, with the short robe surgeons limiting their trade to bleeding, leaching, cupping, applications of enemas, and management of brothels, more than likely treating venereal diseases. All other surgical procedures were performed by long robe surgeons, including tooth extraction. The, the dental pelican was the first dental instrument used for tooth extraction. Dating back to the 1300s, this device was used for extracting teeth, and it was a brutal, brutal instrument. Simple extractions were simple, complex extractions were not so. It was so effective, it usually took out the offending tooth as well as its neighbors, and sometimes even an entire section of jawbone. This was later replaced by the safer pre-forceps method of the dental key in 1740, moving into the early modern era. Okay, folks, until next time, thank you from Dr. Mo Budak. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Thriving Dentist Coaching and Action segment. This is Narain, your co-host. Today's topic is, are your team members disengaged? Before I jump into today's topic, I want to take a minute to thank Mo 
Dr. Mo Budak for that wonderful, wonderful video that he created, uh, History of Dentistry Part 4. We'll put a link to that on show notes. So find this podcast and then definitely watch that video. It's definitely worth you uh, doing what you need to to get to this page. Thank you, Dr. Budak. You know, Naren, uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned that there's a video with that because uh, a number of our uh, contributors have gone the extra effort to produce a video and uh, Mo put together a really cool slide deck uh, and he has videos for all parts of, of the history of dentistry series. So yeah, just go to thrivingdentist.com, click on podcast, scroll down, find this episode and there'll be a link to the video. I think uh, while you will enjoy listening to it, you'll enjoy it even more by watching the video. Absolutely. <clears throat> Are your team members disengaged? Great topic. And as as all of you know, leadership is something that we discuss on this podcast, right? This is the Thriving Dentist podcast. It's for thrivers, people who want to create a bigger future, better future, not only for themselves, but for their team members and their patients. If your team members are not engaged, then you cannot have a thriving practice because you know you you have only two hands, right? Your team members each have two sets of hands. So just you alone cannot create this amazing practice that patients love coming to that creates financial, personal, and professional satisfaction. So Gary's going to get into some specific reasons why team members are disengaged. Of course, he knows this because he works with clients and he has been for the last 43 years. So he has seen the good, the bad, the ugly. And um, he just wants to highlight some of those reasons why team members are disengaged and, of course, provide solutions. So, Gary, take it away. Yeah, I'm excited about this topic um, because, you know, Naren, as you mentioned, uh, leadership is uh, a necessary requirement uh, for the owner of the practice to have a thriving practice. Uh, leadership uh, is part and parcel to it. I've made my life's work um, uh, uh, studying thriving practice, studying world-class practices. And uh, there's some common denominators I've, I've noticed in those. And one of those is, is that uh, the, the dentist uh, is, a, is a leader, is effectively leading his or her team, um, leading their patients and showing leadership in the community. Uh, another common denominator among world-class practices uh, is that team members are fully engaged, fully engaged. I think we'd all agree that in, in our perfect world, all of our listeners would have a practice where team members were 100% fully engaged, putting heart and soul into their work every day. Uh, however, uh, even in very strong practice uh, practices, engagement can kind of wax and wane. There can be times where, where the team is more engaged than others. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, some details today that will help you have a, a more engaged team. Um, now, one of the things I've noticed in, in, in my work, um, and this is work with clients and in, in, in my work over the years as a coach, is as I look at the financial uh, details of a practice, financial performance, I often notice that uh, if we look at, say, 12 months, Naren, and we're looking at the, the year at a glance and we're looking at uh, 12 months, you know, production and collection numbers. It's not uncommon for me to see a couple of months that represent the low watermark in, in the performance of the year of the practice. It's not unusual for me to see two or three of the months represent the low watermarks and they're the weakest months of the year. And oftentimes those months correspond with the doctor taking vacation time. The doctor taking vacation time. Does that make sense, Darren? Absolutely, Gary. So maybe I mean, it's spring break. Maybe the doctor chooses to take a spring. Maybe the kids are school-age kids and they choose to take a spring break. Uh, maybe it's a summer vacation. Maybe it's around the 4th of July or it's a summer vacation. Maybe it's a longer one. Um, and, you know, maybe they choose to do something, you know, in, in the fall um that represent or or maybe it's around the holidays that would be maybe maybe more likely Naren, where uh, a practice will take uh the week off between christmas and new year's um and uh, you know this provides a nice tie-in to um our upcoming master class where i talk about you know how uh some tips to to create a practice that provides work-life balance let me go on record as saying doctor i want you to take more time off oops Wait a minute. Am I contradicting myself? 
I want you to take more time off, but I want you to have a world-class practice. I want you to have both. Those are not mutually exclusive. You can have a world-class practice and take a generous amount of time off. Now, Darren, on the surface, those might seem to be contradictory. Is that correct? That is correct, Gary. You look and say, wait a minute, Gary, you can have one or the other. You can have time off or a world-class practice. No, I want you to have both. <laughs> I want you to have a generous amount of time off. Uh, right. If you're taking two or three weeks off a year, you're not taking enough time off. You, you do not have effective work-life balance. <laughs> you don't. And, and you just have to be honest with yourself. Uh, you don't. But one of the things I've noticed is in those practices, when we look at the low water marks, you know, they represent times where doctor had a, had a week off uh, or more, you know, off. And, and when that happens, if the office happens to have a bonus system in place where, where maybe it's an overall team bonus and maybe it's tied to something like collections, Aaron, what do you think happens to the team motivation and engagement when they look at that month and say, oh, it's going to be a short month this month? What do you think of, of the mindset or the thinking of team members? What happens? I mean, put yourself in their shoes, right? I mean, they are counting on that bonus and there's no way they're going to want it. They want it. Yes. And there's no way they're going to hit it. So you kind of are resigned to it. You're kind of giving up on it, right? It's like, uh, there are those, like, imagine a kid who says, you know, no point in me even trying. It's kind of one of those things, right? Like I'll get a zero anyway. So who yeah, the, base, the baseball not? team, you know, you're, you're down 12 to nothing. <laughs> You know, and what is what do the players on the team do? They throw in the towel, you know, yes. forget it. Let's get this game over with. Well, yes. that's what happens in dentistry. It's just a it's it's an adult work version of the baseball team being down 12 to nothing. Right. Um, so uh think about that. Has that ever happened in your practice? Have you ever had that happen where you have a short month? And and actually a lot of subplots kind of creep in there. Uh, team, even good team members can have resentment about the fact that you're taking time off. And I don't mm. want team members to have resentment for you taking time off. I want the team member to want you to take more time off. Does right. that make any sense, Naren? Yes. Um, and so a lot of subplots can kind of develop around that and uh, contribute to disengagement. Um, so I'd like to introduce some solutions that will help you create um, a fully engaged team more of the time. Um, and I think there's another common denominator that I've noticed among world-class practices. The owners of world-class practices are planners, are planners. Naren, you and I have never talked about this. Yeah. Would you recognize what I just said is true? That is true. I mean, in life, the people who create amazing things are typically, I'm not saying all of them, but more than likely are going to be planners. And I think in dentistry, planning is perhaps even more important because of the nature of uh, our appointment cycles. Right. So, uh, Naren, you know, if a patient is healthy, we typically like to see them for uh, returning visits for hygiene every six months. Yes. Uh, and so we've got to be looking out at least, you know, six plus months. Yes. Uh, and really, it's not six. It's more like seven or eight months in advance. We've got to have our, our schedule plan six or eight months in advance. Because of the fact that we, our hygienists need to know what their work schedule is, you know, what our, when we're seeing patients in, in some states, uh, offices are not able to see hygiene patients if the doctor is away. Um, Arizona happens to be a little bit different. There's some states that function like Arizona where they call it uh, indirect supervision, uh, meaning that our hygienists can see patients if the doctor isn't there, as long as the doctor is accessible. Um, and they can be accessible by phone. As long as they're accessible, then, um, and there's some restrictions. We, we can't give anesthetic, uh, so we can't do, um, we typically can't do perio, um, you know, SRPs during that time. But in Arizona, our hygienists can see patients if the doctor is away. And of course, this might change too uh, regarding your practice uh, format. Are, are you a solo doctor practice? Um, do you have multiple doctors in your practice? If you have multiple doctors, it gives you more flexibility in terms of providing coverage. But no matter what, I think it's fair to say doctors need to be planners and we need to be thinking well in advance. Um, and even your CE, you know, you need to be thinking about your CE well in advance. Um, so one of the suggestions that I'm going to make, I'm going to, I'm going to now move, I'm going to pivot to more granular details. Now, in order to get a more engaged team, one of the suggestions that I'm going to make is that we change the way we look at recording practice performance. Right. 
historically near, and we, we, we follow the calendar system. We follow you know, the other 12-month calendar system. Well, I'm going to suggest that we still follow uh, the idea of 12 time periods, but I'm going to suggest rather than having the randomness, what, what do many dentists subconsciously say in their head when they go into February? Now, February is what? Uh, I mean, a short month. Short month, yeah, 28 days. And plus, uh, it's a cold month, right? Uh, depending on where you are. <laughs> That's kind of what I remember. Well, they may think I'm going to lose some snow days or you know different things. But yeah. many dentists subconsciously go into the month of February kind of throwing in the towel. Well, it's a short month. Uh, uh, we'll see what we can do with it. So yeah. what I'm going to suggest you do may sound radical, but when you think about it, I want you to really think about this. And I want you to consider putting this into action. I want you to consider measuring practice performance in 12 equal time periods, equal, equal meaning number of work days in that time period, 12 equal time periods. So that way you never have a short month. They're all the same. You know, we're still going to follow roughly follow the calendar, but there may be a little bit of variance to that because the second month may extend a little bit into March, <laughs> but we can extend the second month into March uh, because March is a long month, right? So we can extend yes. that. So what I'm going to suggest you do is you start thinking about your year differently. Instead of thinking of it like the calendar, I want you to think of it as 12 equal number of work days in each month. Right. All so right. let me clarify this. So let's say um, that is, um, you know, I take six weeks off uh, and then one week is uh, two weeks is uh, holidays. Let's say, you know, Christmas, et cetera. I'm just making out my math easy. Right. Well, let's think about what it might impact your year. Yes. The, 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 the number of vacation weeks you take. And by yes. the way, doctors, I would like to su suggest that I'd, I'd like you to see, take at least six pure vacation weeks. Those wouldn't be CE weeks. Um, and you know what? If you're traditionally taking two, well, maybe you don't go from two to six. Maybe you go from two to four. And mm. then you go from four to six. You know, think about it. You can get there stepwise. Right. But ideally, I'd like you to take it and think, would you, how would your life be different if you had six pure vacation weeks a year? How would that be? And maybe, you know, there's many doctors that have never taken more than a single week at a time off. Now, if you're planning an international trip, I'm telling you, that Trying week that you take off is going to be very difficult because of the travel on either end. You're going to be, you're going to need a vacation from the vacation if you're <laughs> taking a one week trip to Europe. <laughs> so think about this. You're going to have the number of vacation weeks that you have. Now, um, most CE time, uh, generally, you can find ways to take your CE on the weekends, you know, Friday and Saturday. Now, if you're taking the continuum type CE, like we do at Panky or, or at Spear or at Kois, uh, those are often week long, and that might represent another week that you're taking off for, for CE. So that might be another week, depending on, you know, the way you're handling your CE. And then holidays. Holidays, uh, we've counted out the holidays, and depending on which ones you recognize and which ones you, know, you choose not to recognize, then there's typically seven to 10 days of holidays. So let's say you start doing the math on that, Naren. And, and let's say hypothetically, um, you're, you're taking six weeks off, so 52 weeks minus six. We're at 46 weeks now. And let's yeah. say you're in the CE cycle where you can take your CE on the weekends. So you don't have to take a week off for CE. But let's say you've got another seven days of, of uh, holidays that you're taking off, you know, like 4th of July, uh, like Thanksgiving, like the Friday Thanksgiving, those days. And let's say that number seven, I'm just picking a number that might represent uh, an accurate number for many dentists. Then let's do the math. Well, we've got uh, 46 weeks. Um, and, and let's say hypothetically that um, you're working four days a week. So, so we take 46 and, and multiply uh, by four. And that gives us 184 work days for the year, but, but I didn't include the holidays yet. So now I subtract the holidays. And let's say, for my example, it's seven. And we get to 177 work days for the year. Now you divide that up into 12 equal time periods. 12 equal time periods so that there is no bad month where we throw in the towel. Does that make sense, Darren? Yeah. So just kind of keep going a step further. So let's say, let's round it up 180 days divided by 12. That's 15 days in a work period. And now the times you're off, let's say you're going on a break for two weeks. So you need 15 work days plus the days you're off to make that period. Correct. 
Correct. Yeah, because we want, we're measuring practice performance in 12 equal time periods. 12, 12 equal, equal working days, periods. not, not equal work days, work equal days, work days. days. Yes. So that's where the month may go a little bit uh, field for, from the normal construct of, you know, a 30 or 31 or 28 day month. Right. If one of those time off weeks is Christmas, right. The whole week of Christmas, then, Hey, your December might be a tiny bit longer because you're going to allocate that time off. Well, but because we're doing it in a year, it means that we're going to work it backwards. Yes, so sure. maybe your year ends up on December 23rd. Right. Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Yeah. Cause we're doing, we're still sticking to the year. Yeah. You know, the year mm -hmm. has to still be recognized as the, you know, the end of the year. So if, if you're taking that last week off, then maybe your year ends on December 22nd, December 23rd, however right. you're doing that. Right. Yeah. But now this takes advanced planning because you got to be, be ahead of time. thinking about it. You have to think about how you're going to spend your vacation time. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? And, and yeah, maybe it's, uh, I think many people enjoy taking vacation time, you know, uh, at home, <laughs> you know, and getting a chance to to reconnect with the kids and and uh, uh, spouse. Um, so anyway, this is a whole different way of thinking uh, because now we could put a bonus system in place, a collection bonus system that says if the practice collects above this number or above, then in that in that period, a bonus in place, right in that period, and nobody will throw the towel in because oh, this month's never going to make it because it's a short month. We're basing it on the time period, the equal time periods. This can be a very cool way of creating team member engagement. So even, even good practices can have times where team members disengage. Hmm. And now they're going to create a consistent uh, a series of engagement um, be, because they don't have the excuse of, well, it's a short month. And, and as a result, they're not also, also another possible byproduct is they don't begrudge the doctor taking time off sure. because it doesn't affect them. Now it literally doesn't affect them. It's, it's simple, but it requires a shift in thinking. Makes sense. Because so, we're so tied into the calendar. Right. So going back to the title of our podcast, it's all about, you know, disengagement. So is this one of the reasons you see practice or team members getting disengaged, Gary? This problem. Yeah, you just absolutely. Thought? Even good team members will will look at a short month. They're, they're looking at March when the doctor's taking a spring break. Mm -hmm. say, well, we have a bonus, but we're never going to get it mm -hmm. because we only have you know this number of work days. Um, and then we're we're looking for consistent performance across those twelve time periods. So right. we're not going to say, oh well, this is you know throw in the towel this month. Um, and it really creates a, a dynamic uh, that is. Uh, just a positive dynamic that happens in the practice. The other, uh, I want to make this not one dimensional, but there are other dimensions involved in, in having an engaged team. And another dimension for that, another thing that you can work on, doctor, is, um, is to be completely consistent about looking for opportunities to complement your team members, looking for opportunities to complement your team members. Uh, I've noticed in my coaching that that seems to sometimes accidentally wax and wane. Sometimes doctors are really good at complimenting. Other times it becomes a forgotten art. But if you want engaged team members, you're going to compliment them. And the more specific you can, the specific you can be about those compliments. One thing to say, Susan, you did good today. Uh, thank you. Now that feels warm and fuzzy, doesn't it? Yes. Sure. Uh, but if you can be specific about it, Susan, I happened to be walking down the hallway today and I heard you talking to that patient mid-afternoon and the patient had all those questions about her insurance and you were so patient. Uh, you answered every one of her questions. I can only imagine that that patient walked out of the office feeling very good about the fact that you took time to answer her questions. You have sure represented our practice well today. Thank you for that. Thank you. That's a different level of compliment. Another great way to create engagement. Well, Naren, our Q&A segment is going to allow us to go a little bit deeper into some of the details around this concept of having 12 equal time periods. Let's hit pause here on the coaching and action segment, and uh, we'll pick it up again uh, in the Q&A segment. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Thriving Dentist Q&A segment. It's Naren again. Gary, I have four questions for you. The first question I have for you is, 
I have the monthly bonus based on collections. I can totally identify with the story you just shared about team members essentially giving up on bonus, especially during those months when the doctor is on vacation time. How do I stop this from happening? Yeah, I, I really think, uh, you know, this is something that's so common. So doctor, don't feel like you're alone in that regard. I mean, especially if you are a solo, solo doctor practice, um, because the, the team's looking at it like, well, there's no way we can hit that. And, and that's not something they discover towards the end of the month. They go into the month with already a resignation of a concept, a re resignation mindset. So if that's March, they don't wait to the end of March to feel like, oh, well, we just couldn't get there. March 1st, they're already flying the surrender flags. Do you, can you see that happening there? Yes, yes. Because they're smart already people. They, they yeah. look at it and say, how in the world are we ever going to get there? You know, how can we get there? Um, so I really think the answer is, is those 12 equal time periods like we talked about. Again, just do the, it's arithmetic. It's fifth grade arithmetic to come up with the, the, the math. Um, you know, how many weeks, how many weeks are you going to take off? Um, be sure to subtract any C if you're taking a, a Panky CE week, or if you're taking a Spear or Koi CE week, be sure to take those off. Uh, and then look at your uh, holidays. Remember, every year will be a little different with holidays because of the way the rotating holidays uh, fall. Um, you know, Fourth of July could be on the weekend in in some some years, but uh, you know, this year, of course, it was it was during the week. Um, some holidays are, are fixed. You know, Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving Friday always fall during the week. But be sure to figure out how many holidays are you taking off. And then just do the algebra and then and then take that number and divide that. You might want to round a little bit so you have equal days. Uh, like we rounded from 177 to 180 in the example we gave in the coaching in action. Because you take 180 and you divide by 12, we have 15 work days. 15 work days, a, a time, you know, a, 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 a time period. I almost fell into the trap of saying a month. And it's not actually a month because again, as you go through those 12 equal time periods, they may vary a little bit by the way the months fall. Uh, but I think that's the answer to, to it because now we've got 12 equal time periods. There should be no reason why um, we throw in the towel because we have all equal work days. Everyone's going to be engaged. Everyone's going to be saying, hey, I can do it. Now, how do they go into the first day of the month, Naren? So on the first day of every time period, None of that resignation happens. Does that make sense? That makes sense, Kenny. That makes sense. Um, I, I think I think you hit on you you hit on something that perhaps doctors don't think about because um, you know they're just so busy with everything else. And I think just make them pause and look at it differently, like from the perspective of the team members. So I really appreciate you for that, Gary. And yeah, I think you this know, episode I, is going to be I a viral episode. I think a lot of listeners are going to say, you know, now that you mention it, that is what's happening in my practice. Yes. There's two or three, uh, you know, months of the year where, you know, and it's, I think it's subconscious there. And I, I don't think people walk in raise, waving a surrender flag, your team yes. members do that. But I think from a, a standpoint of putting their best effort forward and making things happen, um, some minor sort of behavioral changes happen because of the fact that they feel like it's not possible. It's not possible. And when people feel like something is impossible, they give up. That's human nature. That's a, a, a human dynamic. They've got to feel like it's possible. Um, and that, yes, we can do this. And I think this is going to be a way to do that. Now, if you're not a planner, this is going to force you into becoming a planner. And I think that's a good thing <laughs> for the record. I think that would be a good thing. You know, plan your CE, plan your major CE three years in advance. That's one of our 24 systems, Darren, that um, world-class dentists, thriving dentists, plan their major CE three years. And I'm not talking about, you know, the, the course that comes to town and you want to take it. I'm talking about your major CE, like you're working toward becoming accredited by the AACD or you're working on achieving a fellowship in an implant society. Um, you're working on achieving your fellowship or mastership in the AGD. Plan that in advance. But first of all, I think that's going to be um, one of the things that keeps you engaged. Naren, we've talked during the coaching and action segment about team members being disengaged. Is it possible for a doctor to be disengaged? Even the owner? 100%. Heck yes, it is. Yes, because you, you give up, right? If you think it's not going to be happening and then you give up. And then the other thing that happens is 
if you have that bad month, next month is not going to be not going to be that great because your motivation is low, your 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 belief in yourself is low, your confidence is low. So it'll almost take like a few weeks to it just has get a back. continuation effect. Yes. Yes. And maybe even it affects the way you enjoy your holiday. Like if you're in, you know, doing a spring break and you're thinking, oh, geez, I'm worried about collections this month because, you know, da, 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 da. Um, and maybe you start thinking about, you know, how it affects your mindset when you're on holiday. Right. And that's not good. Let me ask you question number two, Gary. Thank you for that. Question number two is under the system, how do you recommend handling vacation time for team members? Oh, great question. Um, so I do like the idea um, of uh, also being um, fair and generous with team members in terms of time off. However, it also has to be a model that works for the practice as well, uh, financially. So if you're going to take, say, six weeks off during the year, um, one of the things that I recommend that you do uh, is that you you stop short of requiring team members to take their time off during those weeks. But you highly suggest that your team members, if at all possible, take their vacation time during those six weeks. And now you publish that well in advance. So your team members that are planners have that vacation schedule well in advance. Now, I would stop short of requiring it. Uh, you know, many practices, the, the maximum amount of uh, paid time off is two weeks. I would go a little further and I'd be a little more generous with paid time off. And I would give them three, after a certain period of time, not, not initially, but after a certain period of time, give them three weeks paid vacation. But those vacation weeks need to be taken during the six weeks that you're off. Mm. Again, I wouldn't require that because you may have a team member. Let's say you have a team member whose spouse only gets one week a year off in their job. And it is a prescribed week. Their boss tells them when they can take off. They don't get any choice in it at all. But they, you know, your team member wants to take that same time because that's when the spouse has off. But it doesn't fall within the same the six weeks that you're off. Now, one thing you could do is if you have flexibility in the time you have off, if you have a situation like that, you could work with that team member and say, what week would you like off this week, this year? What week? is is your spouse have off and if that was flexible with you then you might decide that you know what i'll make that one of the weeks off so that way you can take your three weeks within ours but if that just didn't work out either because of your planning or theirs then i would be flexible on a case-by-case -case basis and i would allow them to take a week outside of that uh, if that was the only option they had to take so they still get three weeks off at the max if they're at the max um but one of those weeks could fall outside of the, um, you know, the time that you're off. That way your team members are working when, 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 you know, you're having a crew work, you have phones covered. You may, if you're in a state where hygiene can see patients, we're seeing hygiene patients. And that way we're being a little more generous with the time off. We've gone from two to three, but we've asked a trade-off that here's the weeks, you know, here's the six weeks where you can take your three weeks. Thank you. Can I explain that in a way that makes sense, Nerd? That makes total sense, Gary. Uh, I think that's a smart move. And I think uh, you are creating this environment of we all want to work hard and play hard. So let's take time off, you know, perhaps more so than what others are willing to do uh, as a team. But at the same time, let's focus when we are here and really hit our targets. When we're here, we're here. Yes. Uh, work hard, play hard. Yeah, I like that thinking a lot. Thank you, Gary. Uh, question number three, I have bonus systems uh, I have had bonus systems in the past, and frankly, they have not worked for me. I haven't had a great experience. Help convince me why a bonus might be helpful. You know, thank you for the candor and honesty of that question. Uh, you're not alone, doctor. Uh, I'm sure there's many listeners that says, I've tried bonuses and, and they just haven't worked. I think one of the reasons they, they haven't worked is they're poorly designed. Uh, they're designed, they're too complicated. Team members don't understand. There can be all kinds of reasons why a bonus didn't work. But one of the ones that I see repeatedly is that it's so complicated, you have to have a PhD in economics to understand it. And what actually happens, the team members don't understand it. And they come to you at the end of their month with their eyes closed and their hands out. Did we get it? Did we get it? Did we get it? You know, like it's a mystery. And if it's a mystery, then your bonus isn't working because they didn't know what they did to get it. Mm. They didn't know what they did. And so if they didn't know what they did and it was a happy accident. What's the likelihood of repeating that? 
well, it'd be another happy accident. It wouldn't yes. be, it wouldn't be anything intentional. So first of all, it has to be simple. Um, I personally like, and we have this in place in many of our client offices that I work with as a coach. Uh, we actually have two bonus systems in place. We have some individual bonus systems uh, for key team members with uh, bonusing them on something they have control over. For, for example, the doctor scheduling coordinator, doctor scheduling coordinator. And we'll have a daily doctor goal, daily doctor goal. Remember, if we're doing these um, uh, 12 equal time periods, that just made this bonus really easy, right, uh, Naren? Because yes. every month we have the, the same number of doctor work days, every period, every period and time period, not month, but every time period, we have uh, the equal number of work days. So the way we bonus that is the doctor scheduling coordinator. Um, I like a two-tier bonus system. Let's say that uh, the tier one is to have 100% um, of doctor goal. So what, whatever your daily goal is times the number of work days. An example that we were using, 15 work days. So we take the doctor daily goal and multiply by 15. And if she's at or above that in, in production, uh, then she gets a $250 bonus. And by the way, you could plug in whatever pay out, pay out amount you like. Uh, oftentimes, that's a good number right there, 250. And then we have a tier two that if, if doctor is at 110% or more, so an additional 10%, then we double that bonus to 500. By the way, that bonus will pay for itself based on the increased doctor production. And now I've got someone owning your schedule. And I have someone that has the same agenda as you, and that's to schedule you at or above goal every month. So we can have individual bonuses for key team members and then have an overall team bonus where if we collect above this amount every month, we have a format for sharing uh, a bonus in the amount that we've achieved above the goal. And Dr. Those are simple. Uh, team members can understand it. The fact that we have equal time periods make it even better because now no one's going to throw in the towel and say, well, this month we, we have no chance of hitting it and all the related angst that goes along with that. Uh, so I would ask you to give it, give it another chance, give it a chance in terms of, um, designing it simply, uh, and also, uh, designing it in a way, uh, that's, um, maybe a little bit of a stretch, but also within, within reality, within, you know, with, if it's too far uh, of a stretch, team members realize, oh, that's not even possible. So it should be a little bit of a stretch, but not so much that they feel like they can't do it. Let me ask you question number four, Gary. Um, I know this sounds crazy, but I have a couple of team members <clears throat> who are not motivated by money. How can I create engagement with these team members? Uh, you know, doctor, that doesn't sound crazy to me at all. That doesn't sound that. You know <clears throat> what? That actually sounds common. That's not unusual to have. Uh, you know, a couple of team members that just aren't motivated by money. And, and it could be in a variety of reasons. Maybe they have family income, you know, from, from spouse or partner that, you know, money isn't their driving factor. Um, I, you know, I think one of the things that we can recognize is that most people in dentistry, whether it be doctor or team members, doctor or team members, the primary reason they were drawn to dentistry is that they're helpers. And they want to help people. Naren, I just made a bold statement. Would you recognize that as true or false? I would agree with that because, you know, I have interviewed people in dentistry, obviously doctors and team members. And that's usually the number one reason that comes up. Why did you get into this? And they're usually like, I, I watched someone when I was growing up and I really looked up to this person and I wanted to be like that person. They make a difference. Maybe they were helped. Maybe they were helped yes. by a, a dentist. And they said, you know, the positive experience I had as a, a child and a teen re really made me think dentistry was super cool. I want to help people. And also, I think uh, the other side of that is people appreciate, you know, those in healthcare, right? Like, I mean, when we are sick or when we need something and we go and this person really makes a difference, we appreciate them. I mean, genuinely, not just, it's not a transaction. It's, it's like, a noble so profession. Much. Yeah, it's a noble profession. It's a noble profession. Yeah. So anytime in your practice, this, this is not just for your team members who aren't motivated by everything we do in the practice, you'll get better results 
if it's patient centric, if it's patient centric, meaning how does this benefit the patients? And so growth, for example, if one was cynical, you could just look at growth as more money, right? But what if we look at growth as a way to help more people have great oral health? Then all of a sudden growth becomes a noble pursuit, not about them. The money's a byproduct of it. Nothing wrong with that, but it's not the reason we're doing it. We're doing that. We want to grow because we want to help more people in our community enjoy the benefits of great oral health. So from a leadership perspective, let me bring it back full circle to leadership. You, you mentioned leadership in the opening, in the coaching and action segment. Yes. A really good leader will lead, uh, will find a way to lead from the premise of how this better serves our patients. Like, let's look at a day where you're not uh, at goal, you're under goal, but you didn't give up. You say, we're going we're gonna to look for opportunities to pick up same day dentistry. But instead of looking at it as raw dollars and what it means to us, turn it around and look at the benefit from the patient. If you have a, a patient in hygiene that has um, fillings that have been diagnosed in the upper right and they remain to be completed, if we can move that patient over to hygiene, take care of those fillings today, um, we could pr possibly prevent something a lot more complicated like root canals and crowns, or we could save them a trip and or save them a trip. They can do it today, save a trip, and maybe help them utilize benefits that they have remaining in their insurance plan. All those serve the patient. So I think we want to lead. We always want to lead from how does this better serve the patient? How does this better serve the patient? And I think if we lead from that, um, it's going to be a rallying point, uh, not only from for your team members that are motivated by money, and many are, I would say the majority are, from my experience. Yes. And, and maybe not that's their prime motivator. That's not their prime motivator, maybe. Their prime motivator is to be a helper. But by the yes. way, they wouldn't mind, they wouldn't mind being paid a little bit more for it. <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> but I think that applies to more than majority, but there's always some that aren't motivated necessarily by money. And heck, you can even find out what does motivate them. Maybe, maybe uh, they have a charity that they are absolutely passionate about. Maybe you can say, hey, uh, we want to. Uh, help compensate you more in the form of a bonus. And if you want to give it away to your charity, that's completely your choice. Way to go. <laughs> you know, way to go. And so find out what the motivators are. But I think if we always uh, focus on a patient-centric approach, uh, you're, you're going to get uh, a practice that um, really is doing the right things for the right reasons, doing the right things for the right reasons. Well, we had some great questions today. Uh, I hope you appreciate this episode. Uh, are your team members disengaged? I hope I've given you something to think about. Um, this idea of dividing the year up into 12 equal workday time periods, number of workdays per time period. Uh, it does require some thinking. You know, here we are uh, coming into the last uh, quarter of the year. Maybe this is something you put on your radar screen for 2024. If you're listening to this, maybe you start thinking about making 2024 the year uh, you divide that that year up into 12 equal uh, time periods based on the number of workdays each each month. I think you'd find that to be a, a massive improvement over the way you're currently doing it. Uh, well, I want to say thanks, Naren. Thanks to, to you for co-hosting this episode. Also, thanks for all the things you do um, at Equa, your uh, a digital marketing agency to help dentists master the world of uh, marketing. Uh, by the way, another way to to get better engagement uh, in your in your practice. Um, is to have patients who actually fully appreciate what you do for them, fully appreciate what you do for them. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to serve those patients when those patients really appreciate what you do for them. And the truth is you could get a patient from a PPO plan that appreciates you. You could. But more often than not, those patients you get from the PPO plan, um, all they want to have dentistry done is if it's, if it's free, if it's covered by their insurance. Right. Uh, and that can lead to disengagement on the part of your team because it's frustrating when you know you can help them. You they have a need, you know you can help them, but the patient only wants to have it done if it's free, covered by their insurance. And so, if you want to have more patients that uh, truly appreciate what you do for them, replace Delta as a source of your new patients with Google as a source of new patients because then they'll find you for other reasons. And there's no better source, in my opinion, than your agency, Naren. Uh, to accomplish that. So if any of you would like to schedule a marketing strategy meeting, um, 
go to equa, e -K -W -A com forward slash MSM and learn how you can replace Delta as your source of new patients with Google as your source of new patients. I also want to thank our listeners. We appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, if you haven't done so already, uh, click subscribe. That means every uh, Tuesday, uh, every Wednesday, excuse me, every Wednesday when we upload a new show, it'll be automatically uploaded for your listening convenience. And if you haven't written a, uh, a review, an iTunes review, uh, please go on iTunes and write us a review. Uh, that'll help more dentists find us. Uh, thank you for the privilege of your time. Naren and I look forward to connecting with you on the next Thriving Dentist Show.